Thank you everyone for coming and uh, welcome. So like Mike said, it's pretty exciting. We have um, two wonderful speakers today. And um, Winston Morton is here from Bermuda. And uh, so the topic is, is very exciting in itself, uh, but I highly recommend after you get some time after the session, ask him some cool stories about Bermuda and, and his life in Bermuda. So, um, so Winston, um, he flew in and uh, is very excited to talk about, and they actually went live, I think, yesterday. So, um, so it's exciting times for them to have Zora in-house implemented. So without any further delay, here is Vincent Morton. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, live yesterday and I'm still here, so that's probably a good thing. <clears throat> I seem to have come down with a really strange cold last night at around 2 a.m., so I've got uh, a little bit of water. <laughs> a little bit of water. So uh, thanks, appreciate the invite. Uh, relatively new user of Zora, and uh, we've, we've had a really good experience with the team, and when the, when the guys asked us to come speak about our implementation, we thought it would be, uh, we thought it'd be great to come down and share a little bit about uh, what we do and uh, how we've used Zora to uh, roll out our new cloud services. So we've got about 20 minutes, I think, per session. So we'll go 20, 25 minutes and have five minutes for, for uh, questions. So we've only got about 10 slides, and uh, Hopefully we won't bore you to death with slides. So, so uh, what we do, we'll talk a little bit about what we do. We're going to talk about our business model and where we use Zora and the cloud services metered um, on the side of, uh, and then services billing, drivers, why we used uh, reoccurring and usage-based billing, uh, how Zora helped us out, what we've learned so far. I'm sure with more to learn, but uh, so far we've got some, uh, some good learnings, and then QA. So uh, Link Bermuda is a fairly traditional telephone company, um, originally cable and wireless Bermuda, so uh, about 120 years old. Um, uh, I was on the acquisition team uh, for, for the cable and wireless Bermuda acquisition about three years ago. So after that acquisition, they asked a few of us to stay on and help them launch a bunch of new products. As you can imagine, cable and wireless and the traditional telecom um, business was around for a long, long time. They're uh, fairly entrenched in the local market from an international point of view, and so we we uh, took a fair amount of time to get the business kind of decoupled from cable and wireless. And the second part of that was new products. So in the last year or so, we've really put a. Winston, yep. Can I get you to speak up just a little bit? Oh sure. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we uh, we really put a push in the last year, year and a half, to get some new products out in the market. And uh, one of the natural progressions we see in the market right now from a telco perspective is getting into the cloud services business. We are already in the data center business. We're already in the internet business. We always had already had a lot of e-commerce companies that did business with us. We thought, hey, cloud's probably, the, probably the, the most natural progression. So we do a lot of business continuity. Most of our customer base in Bermuda is uh, large banking and reinsurance financial companies, as well as the government. So. So this is kind of our network that we, um, we manage and maintain. Uh, we have a fair amount of capacity on a number of systems uh, under sea. We manage three of the four cables that go uh, in and out of Bermuda. So we've got connectivity down to uh, BVI in Miami. Uh, we've got connectivity down to Brazil. We have uh, two routes back to the US. And we also have some new aspir aspirations to put some cables between Bermuda and Canada. So a fair amount of uh, undersea infrastructure, this is how we, we bring in large network and bandwidth internet and private networks in and out of Bermuda. So we have uh, a domestic network as well inside of Bermuda, so we own another company called Quantum Communications. They're, they operate as a competitive carrier and uh, we actually do domestic connectivity in the island. Uh, Bermuda is fairly concentrated, only about 20 square miles but it has an abnormal amount of large business there and, and a lot of capital under, under management there. So we have just about all of the, every building basically of, of uh, the city of Hamilton, which is where most of the business is uh, connected with fiber. We have a network operations center in Bermuda. We also have another network operations center in Canada, our parent companies in Canada. So we actually uh, spend some time um, making sure that we've got redundant network operations between the two locations. Uh, Bermuda's, we have a, a fairly interesting uh, data center. It's really built 
uh, primarily for the military in, in before and after World War II. So we have um, some fairly large infrastructure at the, one of the highest points on the island with concrete walls this thick. And uh, this actually, this picture, this data center is actually built, it's interesting, it's built in the base of what used to be a 100-foot satellite network dish. So this, these, uh, it's actually round. It's the only round data center I've ever seen in my life. So, uh, and it's got, it's, it's uh, fairly, uh, fairly well protected. So we, uh, the government's in here as well, so we're on the critical infrastructure list for the Bermudian government. That means if anything really bad happens over there, we have military guys show up at, at our data center and protect that infrastructure, as well as we're on the critical <coughs> list to get fuel uh, into the data center. We've never had an outage, and we've had some pretty big storms roll through, uh, so we've had 100% uptime. We have some pretty significant infrastructure there. Um, won't go through that all the, the stats, but it's, uh, it's a fairly nice facility. So that's the background on Link Bermuda. Any questions? Okay. At the end, at the end if we have any questions about the uh, facilities or the infrastructure at the end, let me know. So that transition from a, from a fairly traditional model of telco services, which means we live and die by contracts and SLAs, and the longer term contract we can get, the better. The bigger the contract we can get, the better. So we, our whole sales organization, or executive organization, really was uh, focused on contracts, and long-term contracts with very simple monthly reoccurring billing in most cases. To go into a cloud model where we don't have a contract, we have to earn the business every month, and it's totally usage-based is an interesting one. And the, and, and the phone companies tend to not like unknowns. So. When we put a, a system like this in place and we looked at our existing billing system, which was relatively old and built for the telco model, we said, this is not gonna work. We're just not going to be able to move the business quick enough with the, with the old approach, with the old billing system. So fundamentally, we've used this model to kind of create uh, uh, an attitude and a, an approach inside the company to be able to do usage-based billing. So this is the first product, relatively simple out of the gate. We're just selling infrastructure as a service, which is fundamentally servers and storage. We're an Amazon-like company with geographically bounded data. So we're gonna actually keep the data in Bermuda for all those jurisdictional companies that want to be offshore. <clears throat> so the infrastructure as a service really is bundling the virtual server storage. And fundamentally, it's a, it's a, it's a hybrid cloud. We can do similar things to Amazon or Google or Rackspace. And uh, we really do focus on customers that need to be uh, in a jurisdiction that's predictable and offshore that they can support. Um, the really great thing about Bermuda is it's only, you know, less than two hours away from North America. So it's a very close jurisdiction, but still being offshore with a very good rule of law and, uh, you know, squeaky clean financial and, and, and British rule of law. So it's the closest place that you can do offshore business. So we've really geared uh, a cloud product that allows the e-commerce companies to come set up very, very quickly. And we're excited about working with Zora because that actually creates, a, it actually brings down some more barriers that you can set up infrastructure, cloud infrastructure very quickly in a secure environment as well as add a billing and payment gateway to your system very, very quickly. So we're kind of excited. Uh, Zora's, Zora's excited to work with us because we think there's some, probably some companies out there jointly that we can work together on that would, uh, that would fit this model. We also have a secondary uh, data center in Canada, mostly for DR and redundancy point of view, so you can actually back up your data between the two locations. When you start up your cloud services, you can select which data center you want to uh, put workloads on, and uh, we're, we're going to expand those virtual data centers uh, as we see demand in the market. So the other cool part of our service is a lot of our customers told us that we like the Amazon model, but it was very expensive to get data in and out of the cloud. So we said, well, why don't we include that bandwidth? We, we own cables, we own infrastructure, we own internet facilities. Why don't we include that, that network component to the cloud? So in the domestic market, we actually include the local loops, the bandwidth, and the, the private network connections between their private data center and their office. So we're virtually a comm room for that customer. We give them a piece of ethernet cable that actually represents their data center, and they can create that, that uh, data center inside our environment. So we can do the same thing with our MPLS customers. We have a lot of customers on very large global networks. 
we attach their cloud to their existing or their new private IP network as well. So here's the high level design as we, as we kind of went through the, the, the exercise with Zora on how we're going to build this in a model that augments what we have in, in place today for our existing telecommunication services. So we, we actually decided to get the product out quickly and we, and we rolled this whole thing out within about six months, which we thought was good. Most of our billing projects are much, much longer. And uh, so we got within about six months, we had a pro the first product out just launched yesterday is infrastructure as a service. We have a number of other products come out to the market. Backup as a service tends to be very interesting for a lot of our customers. They want to get out of the tape business. They want to be able to us, have us back up their data and allow them to manage their own. They don't mind managing their schedules, but they don't want to manage the physical data anymore. So that's coming out uh, fairly quickly. And then we have some communications as a service. So we have a full class four long distance network voice switch, and we also have a class five domestic product in Bermuda. So we sell SIP trunking and IP trunks and all the communications kind of services, which we think needs to move from the traditional telecom service to the subscription service. So we've got a fairly modern switch that can do these things. We didn't really have a billing system to do it. So that's one of the things we're working on right now. So interestingly enough, when we started to work with Zora, we could, uh, one of the things that we had to really think about is how we develop the product catalogs to meet uh, to match the, the APIs inside of our what we would call our element managers. So every one of our modern systems has a self-service component. Just fundamentally now, everybody includes a self-service web-based portal. So when a customer experiences that order where they want to come in and add or remove or change a service, you can either do that in Zora, in our portal that's using the Zora API that kicks off a call to our back-end system, or we give the customer access to the element manager of the system. In this case, we chose to use um, Joint, which is another uh, company here in town, for our cloud systems where we chose to give the customer direct access to that product catalog. Good part of that is it's less work because it's already set up. They're good at what they do. Uh, we can let the customer make changes to their environment. That, that Joint system then tracks the usage, resends that data out to Zora. The downside is, of course, we're managing two product catalogs. We have to make sure that the synchronization happens between Joint and uh, Zora. We can do that for one or two products. We're, we're, we're fairly certain as we get more products in the portfolio, we're gonna have to consolidate that product catalog into one master product catalog. So I just wanna kinda take everybody through how we did this initially, but it's probably the strategy is gonna change as we get more complicated bundles and more complicated products. So uh, initially launched yesterday with uh, this infrastructure service. Uh, I just talked about basically this slide, how they have their own, we have our own um, product catalogs. Um, talk a little bit about, and one of the things that kind of came up as, uh, as I talked to people here at the conference is why did you pick Zora? Why are you going down this road? What did you see that really the hurdles you could uh, overcome by using a subscription-based piece of software? So we were already a Salesforce user. Uh, again, we've taken a company that's 120 years old and, and really leveraged a lot of cloud-based technologies. We're trying to change attitudes in the company where we have Salesforce. It's an outsourced cloud model. We use Office 365. It's something that we're using more and more to kind of get our company used to the fact subscription is, a, is, a, is the way you know, telecommunications is going to go. So um, just the pure economics of looking at making a change to our existing billing system was a lot of money and a lot of time. And we said, hey, why don't we pick something like Zora where they have experience with our vendors already. It just so happens they were doing business with, uh, with um, Joyan already. So the, a lot of those technical hurdles were dealt with before we came along. We were basically customizing for our environment. And, uh, so, and the other thing is just capital versus operating. We, we don't mind capital. We spend a fair amount. We're an infrastructure-based company. But at the same time, the implementation timelines and the capital to get the system in was much, much lower on the Zora model than trying to adjust our existing billing system. So we took a lot of buy versus build kind of options in our business case, and we very quickly came to a Zora, um, a Zora decision just because it was, the, it was the, they had the experience in the markets we needed to be in. So the pricing and packaging, again, we, we heard it this morning and we heard it yesterday. 
We're not 100% sure we've priced our products appropriately or we've bundled them pro appropriately. We're going to get out in the market. We're going to let customers experience this, and I'm sure we're going to get feedback on how we're going to need to tweak our products. So the fact we have a billing system that doesn't take some of the billing systems we had in the past, it takes three months to implement a new billing change and a new bundle and a new pricing plan. We need something we can tweak in a day. And uh, this is, I think we're look, kind of looking forward to getting some feedback in the market and uh, being able to tweak uh, the pricing on the fly. So uh, the rating and billing, again, we, we, do, we do have a number of kind of traditional products like bandwidth billing that we need to integrate into a, a common billing product catalog and a common bundle that we really like the engine inside of Zora that allows us to do that. Uh, Zora, very quickly to implement, so we've, we've been pretty happy with the team and, and uh, implementation timelines. We're already a Salesforce user, so it, it went quite easily into this existing Salesforce. Our financial reporting, I think we're still going to do a lot more work on that because we're really, we haven't even ran through our first month end yet, so we're going to get, we're going to, I think we're going to get a lot of questions and a lot of implementation training inside of our operational teams to say, hey, what can we use this for and how can we get more reporting out of it and how can we see more visibility. A good example, I'm probably getting close to my time, a good example is we, we actually had to export fundamentally export, export all of our existing billing data out of our billing system every night into Salesforce just so we could get some basic usage metrics because our existing billing system really doesn't give a dashboard kind of view. So we spent a lot of time and effort trying to get more visibility into our product run rates and our, our bundling and, and the effectiveness of these bundles. With this system, it's in there out of the gate. So that's great. So. Uh, as, so the last thing is, is you know, this product represents a relatively small amount of our revenue today. Um, it's great that we can now look at some new products and some new lines of business that we can we can kind of use Zora for. And over time, I'm sure Zora would love it if we move some of our main services over to this product. And I think as we start to bundle traditional with new services, we're going to need a billing engine like Zora to kind of keep us going. So. So this is what we do today. Back, so I think we already kind of covered this slide. You know, we do B2B, B2C. Uh, we, do, we have a, a consumer market. We have a business-to-business -business market. Uh, interestingly enough, and this happens a lot with companies, about top 20 customers represent about 90% of our revenue. So, so we've got some very large customers on the B2B side that really kind of use a lot of our big, big data center services and bandwidth services. So lessons learned, uh, we spent a lot of time trying to define as tight of a scope of work as we could to try to get this product out as quickly as we could in the first three to six months. Uh, if we didn't do that, we've got a lot of ideas for a lot of new products. If we kept changing the scope, we would have never got the product launched. So you know, we did a lot of work on, on what that phase one approach looked like. Uh, we did uh, uh, a very easy cutover because it was a brand new product with a brand new billing system, so we had no impact on existing revenues, which was good. Um, hopefully the impact's going to be we're going to have more revenues in the next few days. So, uh, so this, this deploy measure iterate, we're using, we're using a lot of the data and the lessons learned in this first launch to, to learn for the next launch so we can understand how quickly we can turn, turn, th turn new products around. That's it. Um, microphone. Uh, two questions. One, are, who are your customers? Are like enterprise, ISVs? And the second question is, how do you get the um, uh, cloud infrastructure usage information into Zora by a customer. By a customer? So, yeah, how do we set up a new customer? Oh, okay, yeah, sure. So, first question is, how is our customer market segmented? So, we actually sell, uh, we're, we're in some fairly, fairly well-defined markets. So, the domestic Bermudian marketplace is where we're selling a lot of these cloud services today because they want their data, to, most of them want their data to stay in Bermuda. So there's privacy laws coming out and there's a lot of 
privacy concerns in a place like Bermuda when, they're, when they are a traditional offshore market. So that, that business is a lot of really, a lot of large financial institutions, large in sense of capital, small in sense of people. There's a lot of big funds that are managed by three or four or five or ten people. So they tend to outsource more. They don't want a lot of IT staff. They want to use these subscription services. So that's our, that's our primary market for this service today. The, ex the international market is one that I, I mentioned, where people that want to set up shop in Bermuda, we're looking at the cloud infrastructure as, a, as an enabler for somebody to come to Bermuda and do business there in a relatively easy, cheap, or cost-effective way. And, and uh, that's a new market for us. So we're out beating the streets, and we're saying, hey, look, we've got some, we have some cool tools in the tool belt. Does this make sense? So the second market's less defined for us, but where I think we're going to find. We do have a few large e-commerce players on the island. It's kind of proved this model already. So that's kind of how we've defined the, the markets. Um, from a, a d pure data perspective, the, the, uh, the cloud system itself actually keeps track of every single activity from a subscription point of view the customer does on a, on a rotating basis. So at every night, we actually export everything that's been added, deleted uh, from the account of the customer. So after the customer comes on and signs up for an account, we immediately send them over to sub uh, subscribe to their cloud services. And from then on, every night, everything gets added, deleted. We keep a running tally. It's actually a database that happens where we, we keep track of every single transaction on that account. Zora then rates and bills it. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So it's really a one way. Uh, the element manager actually sends that information to the um, to to Zora nightly. It's uh, so we actually upload the usage and we rate in Zora. So Zora gets raw usage. Well, I mean, it's formatted usage data per customer seg per customer account and then Zora applies rating on top of that. So you can see it's really important because the, the customer portal inside of Joint, for example, actually has prices. So we need to make sure that that you know, per minute cost, or that per day cost is totally synchronized with, with Zora because the rating actually happens in Zora. In terms of um, configuring Zora to, um, you know, apply the rating rules against your usage data, how, how long did that process take? Because obviously there's, you know, kind of, I, I don't know if there's an infinite number of ways to do that, but there's uh, obviously a lot of different, different models. Yeah, um, it took about six weeks, uh, and, and Zora actually did that part of the work for us. So they actually took that raw format file and then manipulated it. We also had the advantage that they'd done it once before with another customer, so they had a pretty good handle on specifically what this file was going to look like and specifically how we're going to rate the, the minute. So it took about five, six weeks. Okay, great. And then how do, how do most of your customers pay? I mean, are they traditional, um, you know, you generate an invoice and then you send it to them and then they send you a check or a wire transfer? Or do you have people paying Yeah, so our big ACH customers are primarily wire transfer, so we have to have an exception rule for that. Obviously, we take wire transfer payments. Domestically in Bermuda, our consumer customers love coming to town, they call it, and paying their bill with cash. <laughs> so we have an abnormal amount of customers that come to a payment location to have a chat and pay their bills. So we're trying our best to move people over to, but it's a social activity. People come to town and they pay their bills. So uh, we're trying to get pe more people and, and really the focus with the cloud consumers make it as self-service as possible. So we are absolutely pushing and moving customers to an online payment method. We, we have seen other businesses show up and say credit card only, and they've been successful. So I think it's just that we've trained our consumer base, and we've been around a long time. I think we've allowed them to pay by check or by cash. I think new products is our opportunity to change that attitude. For the last question, for the folks who are paying by credit card, are using uh, Zora's commerce uh, model as the front end or are using a different system? Yeah, no, they're using the Zora commerce model with a payment gateway in Bermuda. With a payment, okay, great, thank you. Okay. 
Um, how is your usage um, upload structured? Um, is it at the charge level or is it at the rate plan level? So, for example, if you um, create a subscription but then you change your usage metrics, how does that affect your upload for the next month? Yeah, so, so we have to give customers real-time, well, at least daily real-time information because we actually can charge by the hour, by the minute. Right. So that rate plan has to be applied in Zora within a day of the time they change that rate plan. So it's done on a, on a per product level. In okay. So it's a, it's a change to the product catalog, sorry, the subscription product inside of the cloud system. Mm -hmm. And then Zora picks that up right away and it says, okay, this customer added or removed a feature inside of, inside of their catalog. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, I appreciate everybody coming in and uh, listening to us talk about our company and uh, how we've had some experience with Zora. Thank you, Vincent. Sure. Thank you, Winston. Uh, so for the, the, the second half of this, uh, when we were originally looking at uh, this session, one of the things we were noticing was that uh, PCI is actually something that comes up for a lot of our customers. So we actually wanted to include a section to kind of talk about how PCI applies, uh, what are the kind of things you have to think about, because there is a lot of confusion in our customer base about whether or not that applies to them or not. So we actually invited uh, Rand to, to talk for a few minutes about uh, PCI, and that's what he's going to do today. Thanks very much, and <clears throat> thanks, Winston. This will be actually a very complimentary session, I believe. We have been Zora customers for about two years. My company, Cloud Passage, uh, provides security for cloud servers and systems that are running in an infrastructure as a service model. So everything that Winston talked about with regards to doing metered, metered usage billing is actually exactly what we do for our services as well. And as I was putting together my slides with the Zora team, to describe how we do that, we realized we were hitting on some of the same points, and then they actually asked if I could go a little deeper into PCI compliance and, and dealing with that it, for new cloud applications. So just before we get started, actually, I'm curious, how many people here are uh, charging for their SaaS services or their applications, uh, allowing people to pay for credit card? So fair amount. And, and how many people here are actually building their, their infrastructure um, or their services in either a cloud model hosted in a, you know, an Amazon or a, or a link, um, or even in a private cloud data center with VMware, OpenStack, something like that. So fair amount there. And now how many of you have had the joy of a PCI audit? <laughs> well, for everyone who is accepting credit cards or doing anything that has to deal with, with credit card information, you are going to at some point come under the, the scope of the PCI auditors and you will need to show how you're leveraging your application design, your, your service provider, your cloud stacks design, and your business partners like Zora in order to uh, secure that credit card data. And that's actually a big piece of what my company does. We actually provide security and compliance for any application um, in an infrastructure as a service model. So anything hosted in a, a public cloud provider, we do a lot with private and hybrid cloud systems and even traditional and bare metal systems. So PCI, HIPAA, SOC 2, these are all uh, system, these are all compliance regulations we help our customers achieve. Uh, we ourselves actually have, have achieved most of these. And it is a very different world when you're dealing with these new dynamic cloud delivery models than people would have in a traditional static data center. So what we have, what, what Zora asked us to share here today was that beyond the metered usage billing that we're doing, again, we charge by the hour for our security service. Um, in our business, we accept credit cards in multiple ways. People can go through our application and actually sign up uh, on and swipe a credit card in our web portal, and then we'll start charging them through Zora. We can also have people who will actually send us a credit card via a fax or something, and we have to accept that in a secure way. Um, we also provide PCI security controls to our customers, and so we had to do the, the highest level one certification for PCI 
And uh, to our knowledge, we're actually the first to achieve that in an entirely multi-cloud model. We're hosted entirely in Rackspace and Amazon. And that's actually a good proof point this year that many companies who are hosted in the cloud are able to achieve PCI certification, which until recently some people thought was not even possible. So the thing that you need to consider for PCI, and again, PCI applies to any system that accepts, stores, processes, or transmits any kind of credit card number. And one of the things that I'll get to is that even if you're using Zora's uh, payment gateways and their, their iframes for letting you accept credit cards, which is a, a wonderful feature, you still have to, as a company, have process and controls around things like who has access to Zora to get that information. So PCI scope is going to be shared across your organization if you're doing anything with credit cards. Zora can help you with that. Your, also, your other service provider partners can help you with that. But at the end of the day, your company will be on the hook for PCI compliance for whatever part of your business is, is touching that information. Now, it's not something to be completely terrified about. Um, there's a lot of people that had started building cloud applications, started uh, accepting payments, and then realized they needed to do PCI and all of a sudden had this panic moment not, not understanding what that would take. And the truth is that people have been doing PCI for a long time and it's become a fairly well-known process. The th thing that people need to realize is that as you're building more dynamic applications in these cloud models, you're gonna need to take a different approach to some of the architectures and tools that you're using. And most importantly, you're gonna need to choose whatever PCI controls can keep up with that automated self-service metered uh, dynamic systems that the clouds allow you to run. The infrastructure as a service model allows companies to deliver new products and new features faster and to run their business more efficiently. And the last thing that many companies want is to slow down that kind of progress by having to uh, apply PCI or other security controls that could cause an impact to their ability to, to drive new revenue. So what we've, what we've actually seen this year, we've worked very closely with the PCI Council. They've actually updated their guidance. And for folks that are running in any kind of a, a public cloud model or if you're using a, a private, uh, private cloud system, it is absolutely possible to be PCI certified in these environments. Like I said, we actually achieve PCI certification across two different public cloud providers, one of which is not yet PCI certified in their public cloud. And then we have multiple customers that have uh, cleared their QSA audits. The QSA is the person who signs off on your PCI um, on numerous cloud platforms. When it comes to responsibility, I've, I've used this word many times, and it's actually something to be very aware of. There's a, a difference in the way responsibility works now in a, a, a cloud model where you're relying not just on your own developers and security teams, but on your cloud service provider's security teams, and on your payment provider's security teams, and on your security provider's security teams. And so you, at the end of the day, are on the hook, but you need to understand how does, for example, if you're buying a, a cloud servers by the hour, how does your provider handle their security for their part of the stack? The physical facilities, the shared network, the hypervisor, I mean, Winston was talking about that their facility is SOC 2 certified. That's the, the most important first step, and you'll need to be asking your providers for their certification of different levels of, of their infrastructure and the different pieces that you can pass through to your auditor, because since you can't control everything unless you actually build the, build the, uh, the structure for yourself, um, you're going to have to be securing your piece of it and then relying on your partners for the other piece of it. And the PCI Council themselves actually clarified this recently and was able to, to really answer a lot of the questions and confusions that people have had around doing PCI in either a cloud model or a virtualized model. One of the things that they clarified, which has actually been a concern for a long time, is even if you're in a completely private data center, if you're running on a virtualized hypervisor system, there has been some concern and some question around the um, acceptability of a shared hypervisor firewall, just to get a little technical. And so they clarified that and said now it's actually recommended that you run host-based firewalls, get the controls and the security down to the level of the actual virtual machines, as opposed to relying on any shared multi-tenant uh, access control point. 
That's not to say that you can't do PCI in a multi-tenant environment, but they say that you need to have your controls down to the level of that which you have full ownership of. They also clarified things that the, the VM, the actual virtual machines that you're running, the operating system, the applications, you have to take extra care to protect those if they are in a virtual environment because of the risk of, of hypervisor access. And they also stated very clearly that your, your cloud service provider's compliance can help, but it's not necessarily mandatory. So again, you're gonna have to find an auditor who understands the shared responsibility model and can work with not just you, but also your business partners to make this successful. This is a, an example actually out of the PCI Council's guidelines. Uh, basically, PCI is one of the more prescriptive compliance regulations out there, and it's made up of, what they, of 12 what they call data security standards, or the, the PCI DSS. And you'll see here across the 12 um, DSSs, there's you know, shared responsibility for infrastructure as a service and platform as a service. And then if you're a software as a service provider, which many of you are, you are going to be responsible for ensuring PCI uh, to both your, your bank and your customers. And what's interesting about this, if you're building something in an infrastructure as a service model where you're leasing cloud servers by the hour, or in a platform as a service model, say if you're using a Heroku or an engine yard to, to build your platform, or even a Microsoft Azure, then in most of, those, most of these specific PCI rules, you are responsible in conjunction with your provider for that. But one of the ones that's very interesting, here we have number seven, restricting access to cardholder data by business need to know. Even if you are a SaaS provider, or sorry, even if you're using a SaaS provider like Zora to store those credit cards, you and your company have to ensure who has access to, to Zora and that credit card information. So even though Zora is a, a PCI level one certified vendor for storing and processing those credit cards, your business is still responsible for making sure that the, uh, the access to Zora is controlled um, via PCI guidelines. Any questions, we'll have some time at the end, but we'll come back to this. I have some, some more details as well. So PCI in, a, in any kind of infrastructure is a set of guidelines to make sure that you're following best security practices. It does not replace a security program. Usually what um, you know, many of my security professional friends will say is that if you're doing compliance, you can't necessarily say you're secure, but if you have a well-developed security program, then compliance becomes much easier. And it will often, going through something like PCI or a SOC 2 audit, will show you gaps that you may have. The biggest change for all of us, and this is the, the technical track um, and the, for infrastructure professionals, the biggest change for all of us is to understand how the migration from a traditional static or virtualized data center into this new dynamic cloud model for private or public data centers, um, you really have to rethink security and the way that you're approaching all those controls for host integrity and access control and all those things. And whatever security systems you put in place are just as dynamic and scalable as the, the cloud infrastructure that you're building on top of. So what do you need to think about when you're considering any kind of compliance? And this would apply not just to PCI, but also to HIPAA or SOC 2 or any of these things. Four main foundational elements outside of the actual technical controls. We've talked about ensuring that your, your cloud providers and your business partners are compliant, but then you really need to consider who's actually gonna do your assessments and your audits. You need to consider how are you going to design your application, and you gotta, need to consider how are you gonna harden those systems themselves. <clears throat> One of the things that I think is, is really important when you're starting this process is choose your auditor early. Most importantly, choose an auditor who already knows how to do compliance in the type of cloud environment you have. Otherwise, and I can speak from experience, you'll be paying them to learn it on the job. So really important that they have, have done something like this before. Often a good choice is to use the auditor that actually did your cloud provider's audit because they'll be comfortable with that infrastructure that forms the basis of your systems. Uh, you also don't necessarily always have to use an auditor. For smaller companies that need to do, that can do self-audits, you'll need to hire someone internally who understands what it is. One of the things that I find that makes many companies successful is to hire a former QSA, someone who has done PCI audits in the past, 
they're actually very good at coming into a company and, and knowing PCI well enough that they can help a, the business learn and adapt to it. Because PCI is very static and many companies need to figure out, well, what are the other compensating controls I can do as opposed to reading this somewhat vague uh, requirement in the, the PCI standard. Application design is really critical and actually this is where Zora can help a lot because the way that you can limit what's called in-scope um, systems for PCI is by limiting where credit cards are stored. So store, if you have a, a website that's uh, accepting credit cards and then passing them straight to Zora, that's going to help limit to the, the scope that you need to worry about. But don't put those in a log file, because as soon as you put those credit cards in a log file or in your database, then those systems get into scope as well. And then anyone who has access to those systems are in scope. It's very, very, they're very, very serious about protecting that 16-digit number, and so you really need to be watching where that data is flowing. Zora is a, a huge help in this, in that they're able to take responsibility for the storage of the credit cards, the processing of the data. In our case, we actually, like I said, accept credit cards through our own web application and then pass it to Zora through the API, and we accept them sometimes on an order form or a fax sheet. So we had to PCI certify everything up to and including our fax machine, <coughs> and then prove that the processing of that data handled was only handled by business personnel working directly in Zora through all of the secure interfaces. And finally, on hardening the systems, one of the things that I actually like about PCI as a security professional is that it helped people understand that security is more than just firewalls and antivirus. One of the foundational pieces of security that people don't really realize is that just basic configuration management, being able to prove that all of your systems are, are locked down and configured and installed the right way, patches are up to date, these things seem like general hygiene, but if you read some of the, the better known uh, reports out there about data breaches like Verizon's, they'll say that 90 plus percent of all data breaches are due to misconfigurations of systems, not due to an active exploit of, a, of, an, ex of an unknown bug or something like that. So the biggest challenge though is that many of you who are building new services and applications, you know, using a, a cloud technology as your base, are doing that because it lets you develop faster and, and deliver systems to your customers faster. And so you need to make sure that the security aspects of that are automated and can keep up with your developers and your DevOps teams. So in summary, and I've got pointers at the end of this that talk to all the details, um, Zora can be a really good partner here. Um, I didn't say it earlier, but I give a huge shout out to Rob Coe and the Zora Professional Services team. They helped us not only understand how we could use Zora to do our metered per hour billing system, um, but they also really helped us understand how to, to manage the scope of PCI in our initial application design. Zora does have some excellent features that you could embed directly in your application. Um, the whole, their team can tell you more about that. Um, Zora is a, a very, uh, a very well-regarded PCI level one provider. Um, so they're doing everything on their side to protect everything there. You need to think about what are you doing on your side to protect that data. Wrapping up, and then we have some Q and A. Um, really do need to encourage everyone to read and understand what your business partners do and what you need to be responsible for and understand that now early in your process otherwise it will cause you to scramble at the end. Um, when you're moving servers outside if you are in a static data center and considering moving to some type of infrastructure as a service model then you need to figure out how to protect those systems before you move them outside of your own data center. And one of the things that we've recommended to people is that if you have a plan to use any kind of Amazon or Rackspace or Link Bermuda type service for your cloud servers, figure out how to secure those first. Because if you can achieve PCI in a public cloud environment, it's easy to do it anywhere else. And so building an architecture that can be portable and, and take advantage of that will let you grow to use those hybrid architecture capabilities that many people are looking for in the future. And then definitely focus on the, the PCI tenants that you can control. Know what each of those 12 DSS points um, are asking you to do and know who between you and, and your business partners are responsible for that. 
So we have a number of resources. Um, again, this is something that my company does every day. We've done several audits for ourselves and for customers over the past six months. Um, our products and services are meant to help you secure whatever systems you're using to actually build your applications and your services. Um, you can go and we have white papers and kits on PCI to, to show, share everything that you need there. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to take some now. I'll be at lunch and you can also reach out to me over email. So, Q&A. So, please. So uh, if your application is using Zora and collecting the uh, credit card information and passing it to Zora, do you need to be worried about PCI compliance? So you'll need to check directly with, with your team that built it and with Zora. In our case, since we were accepting the credit card in a web page on, on our application and then passing it to Zora, yes, we had to do PCI for our application even though we use Zora on the back end. It's something that, it, again, the, even if you're using Zora and their built-in frames, you need to, to check with your team on whether or not you have to be responsible for the, the business access to Zora to protect that data, as an example. Randy, could you actually speak to the, uh, so we actually have the HPM product as well. Could you actually speak to how that changes that consideration? Well, <laughs> I'll let the Zora team keep me, uh, keep me clear here. Um, the HPM service that Zora has will let you embed an iframe to create to accept credit card information um, directly in directly into their systems. Um, this is something actually we don't use, but I know that there are a number of Zora customers who do. And again, it's a matter of working with your team and, and their team to understand what score what uh, scope uh, of application design will uh, expose the credit cards to different systems.